House is dedicated to promoting reading success for all. We attack illiteracy from three angles. We give teachers evidence-based strategies to teach reading. We provide parents of struggling readers with support and information. And we teach adults to read. Giving the kids the Nye House strategies and letting them know that they can compete with anyone, that's our passion. I know that the work that my teachers are investing in daily is working and it's having a greater impact, not just on the students themselves, but with their families, with our community, with our city. Hello and welcome to Language Comprehension, a parent's guide to structured literacy. I'm Suzanne Carricker, Principal Educational Content Lead at Lexia Learning Systems. Before we talk about language comprehension, I'd like to ground our thinking in the science of reading. What is the science of reading? In a word, it's evidence. It's not an opinion. It's not a philosophical belief. It's evidence. Evidence that's based on gold standard methodologies. Think about medical research that has random assignment to control groups and treatment groups. That's the kind of research we're talking about. Five decades of research that has used those gold standard methodologies and has helped us understand how students learn to read. It has identified reasons why some students struggle to learn to read and it has informed instruction. That's the science of reading. Now, the science of reading guides why we teach what we teach. Another important idea is structured literacy. Structured literacy is the embodiment of the science of reading, or it is the application of the science of reading in the classroom. Structured literacy is about all of the different structures of language, and we want to include those in reading instruction. Effective literacy instruction is structured literacy instruction. It is going to use that evidence from the science of reading. It is going to answer three important questions. Why is it taught? Why do we teach what we teach? What do we teach? What do we teach that is informed by the science of reading and how we teach it? What does research tell us about how to teach reading? Let's start with the why. A very helpful framework in thinking about why we teach what we teach is the simple view of reading. This is a well-validated model of reading that says skilled or adequate reading comprehension is the product of both decoding and language comprehension. Decoding is that translation of printed words on a page into their spoken equivalents. Language comprehension is that ability to derive meaning from sentences and text through listening. Our goal is that skilled, adequate reading comprehension, which is the translation of print into meaning to gain understanding. It's helpful to think about the simple view of reading like a multiplication equation. Anything times zero is zero. So both the components of decoding and language comprehension are essential to reading comprehension. If one or both are missing, then it can lead to inadequate reading comprehension or overall reading failure. 
So let's think about language before we talk about language comprehension. We know that whether we're talking about oral language or written language, there are two domains of language, receptive language and expressive language. Receptive language is understanding language. That's listening, that's reading. Expressive language is the use of language. That's speaking and writing. We infer meaning when we are listening and reading. We imply meaning when we are speaking and writing. So what impacts listening comprehension? We know that interactions at home in the early years are important to language comprehension development. Research has shown us that the quality and the quantity of language in the home is important to the development of language comprehension. So we look at interactions such as the amount of time watching TV with a parent or caregiver there to talk about what is on the television. We're talking about the number of books that are read aloud. We're talking about meals that are eaten together with conversation. We're talking about parents and caregivers using more complex language. They explain how things work. They encourage the use of complete sentences and they use sophisticated words, using famished instead of hungry, for example. They also take advantage of opportunities to teach new words. In addition to the interactions, the home environment is important to language development. The number of family members, the amount of time that's unsupervised, the amount of the background noise in the home, is there a schedule that is a routine that goes on every night and includes reading aloud? And we know research has even predicted language comprehension development by looking at the number of books in the home. Why this emphasis on language development? Well, quite simply, reading comprehension depends on language comprehension. We know that students who start school with this gap in their language are going to fall behind. Students who struggle with language comprehension are four to five times more likely than their peers to have trouble with reading. So when we look at the influence of reading comprehension, we can see what will predict reading comprehension. As you look at that pie in grade one, you can see that 46% of reading comprehension is influenced by the combination of decoding and language. So think about the simple view of reading. 46% of decoding and language predict reading comprehension. And notice that decoding by itself does influence reading comprehension in first grade and language by itself also influences reading comprehension. Now when we get to sixth grade, we see that there's a combination of decoding and language that still predicts reading comprehension, but most of reading comprehension is language. By 10th grade, you can see that language becomes really important to reading comprehension. But still, there's that influence of decoding in language. But underlying reading comprehension is language comprehension. It is critical to reading comprehension. Beyond decoding, the substantial role that language skills play in achievement of skilled reading comprehension has largely been ignored. So we want to talk about what we should teach to support language comprehension development. We know the why, it's important to reading comprehension. Now let's talk about the what. 
Here are five different components of language comprehension that are important to the development not only of language comprehension, but reading comprehension. We'll define each of these components, we'll talk about how they can be developed, and we'll provide activities that help students practice these important components. The next thing we'll look at is the how. How do we teach? How do we teach all of those components that we just looked at so that students will be able to read proficiently? So let's look at the principles of structured literacy. There are four here, and we have one more that I'll show you in a minute, but these are the really important principles of structured literacy. Explicit means that the instruction is directly taught. We don't assume that students will discover the information they need on their own. It is directly taught. It is systematic. That means that it's logically ordered, and it moves from simple skills to more complex skills. It is cumulative, which means that new learning builds on prior learning. That means that each level is built on a solid foundation. So as students learn more and more skills and information about reading, there's a solid foundation. And the next principle really has two pieces that go hand in hand, and we really have to think about them as going hand in hand. And that's the idea of diagnostic and responsive. Diagnostic means that progress is monitored. Responsive means that instruction is adjusted according to what is found when progress is monitored. Another principle that is important to instruction is the idea of multisensory, multimodal instruction. That means that more than one sense or modality is used in the teaching of reading skills. Listening, speaking, reading, writing, moving, touching, one, two, three, all of them are used in instruction. Why is multisensory or multimodal instruction important? Because it increases engagement and it enhances memory. So let's look again at that simple view of reading to help us understand more about what it is we're going to teach. Remember, both of these components, decoding and language comprehension, are vital to reading comprehension. Language comprehension is that ability to derive meaning from sentences and text through listening. So we do want to teach vocabulary, for sure. Vocabulary is part of listening comprehension. But let's do a little bit of math. Let's just assume that students learn 20 new words a week. And they do that every week of school. That's usually 36 weeks. That means that each year students will learn 720 new words. Now, if students learn 720 new words a year, and they do that for 13 years of school, kindergarten through 12th grade, that means they've learned about 9,360 new words. So is that enough? Is that enough for them to really understand what they're reading? Well, here's what the average student needs to be successful in college. That's 60,000 words, which equates to five new words a day from age two to age seven. So clearly, explicit instruction of vocabulary is important, but it's not enough. Think about what we said about language in those early years and then how important interactions are. That complexity of language is important in those early, early years. That needs to continue through 12th grade in addition to the explicit teaching of vocabulary. So what do we want to teach in addition to that vocabulary? That's what we think traditionally about when we think about 
language comprehension is that vocabulary. But we want to think about these components. We want to think about morphology, which is the study of those meaningful parts of words, prefixes, roots, suffixes, combining forms. We know that morphology is a nice bridge between word level reading. In other words, if students learn these meaningful parts of language, it will help them perceive how to divide longer words. But we know that morphology is also important to meaning. When students see these different word parts in words, they can figure out the meanings of those words. Even though they don't know them, they can figure them out. So here's an example of morphology. Lucy says, I can't imagine what happened to Charlie Brown. And Linus says, he didn't really want to go to camp, did he? Well, then I think it's quite obvious where he went. And Lucy says, obvious? It may be obvious to you, but it sure was disobvious to me. Uh, unobvious, exobvious, anti-obvious, inobvious, subobvious, and non-obvious. Well, the whereabouts of Charlie Brown may not be obvious, but what is obvious is that Lucy understands morphology. So we want to teach those meaningful parts of language. Now, there are a lot of definitions on this slide. I'll go over them quickly, but we're going to talk about them as we look at different activities that help to develop students' understanding of morphology. The first definition is base word. A base word is a plain word that can stand alone, like the word house. It has meaning all by itself. A root is a meaningful part of a word that cannot stand alone, like spect, which means to watch or look, which can't stand alone. It has to be attached to another word part, as in inspect. Suffix is a letter or a group of letters that are added to the end of a base word or a root. A prefix is a letter or group of letters added to the beginning of a base word or a root. And then we have these meaningful word parts that we call combining forms. Combining forms are meaningful parts of words, usually derived from Greek, that can be found anywhere in a word. Combining forms are found in words like auditory, symphony, microscope. A morpheme is a word or a meaningful part of a word. So it can be a base word, it can be a prefix, it can be a combining form. So we know that it is important to teach those prefixes, those base words and suffixes that students will see in kindergarten through grade two and beyond. So we know that a base word can stand alone. If we add a prefix, it can change the meaning. If we add a suffix, it can change the way in which the word is used. So help can be a noun, it can be a verb. Unhelpful, it becomes something that is used to describe someone, so it's an adjective. If we add full, we also have an adjective. So when students are learning about these different morphemes, they're learning about what they mean, and they also help students begin to understand how words function. Do they function as nouns, verbs, adjectives, or other parts of speech? As students arrive in third grade, they're exposed to more morphemes that come from Latin and Greek. And we know that the density of these word parts increases as students go through school. So it is important that they learn the meanings of Latin and Greek morphemes. Latin words are found throughout the curriculum, across many subjects, the Greek morphemes tend to be those words that are found in science. So we want to teach these very systematically, explicitly, 
cumulatively. So a helpful activity for students to help them see these morphemes in words is to have them look at words and first count the number of syllables. When they say the word, how many beats or claps are in the word? And then for them to think about the morphemes. Sometimes the number of syllables and the number of morphemes are the same. So in the word helplessness, there are three beats, helplessness, and there are three morphemes, helplessness. So we have a base word and two suffixes. Underground has three syllables, underground, but it has only two morphemes, underground. Under is a prefix meaning below, below ground. Now what I'd like you to do is think about the words interrupting and conducting, and I'll give you a moment to think about the number of syllables and the number of morphemes in each of those words. Okay, let's see how you did. Interrupting has four beats, interrupting, but it has three morphemes, inter, rupt, and ing. Inter meaning between, rupt means to break, ing means happening now. So interrupting is breaking in between right now. Conductor, three syllables, conductor, and three morphemes, con, duct, and or. Con meaning together, duct meaning to lead, or meaning one who or that which. So a conductor is one who leads the symphony together. The next component that is important to language comprehension is semantics. And semantics deals with word meanings it also deals with relationships between words. So as we think about semantics, we're thinking about vocabulary. We're thinking about multiple meanings, shades of meaning. We're thinking about metaphors and idioms. So here's a cartoon that really helps us understand the idea of breadth of vocabulary. Vocabulary is important to language comprehension but remember, language comprehension is vocabulary and much, much more. But for this cartoon to be funny, this sign may be ambiguous. It's important that you understand the meaning of ambiguous. If you don't understand the meaning, the cartoon will not be funny. So researchers in, at the University of Pennsylvania, Isabel Beck and her colleagues, have looked at vocabulary in terms of what are the most important vocabulary words to teach. And the researchers put together an idea of thinking about the different tiers of vocabulary. We know tier one words are those words that are basic everyday words that we use in everyday conversation. They're words like gather, homework, everyone. We usually don't have to teach those explicitly and systematically. They're words that will be part of conversations and discussions during the school day. Again, if you think back to what we said about the development of language at home, most of those tier one words are going to have their beginnings at home and in school. Tier two words are those words that are used across the curriculum and across grade levels. Those are words such as concept, process, approach, evaluate, cognitive, and proficient. Tier three words are going to be words that are specific to a particular context. So isosceles to math, molecule to science, laissez-faire to social studies or government. So there are three different tiers of vocabulary. Which tier is going to be most important to academic success? Here you see tier one words, together, hungry, yesterday, tired. Those are words that probably don't need explicit systematic instruction. They need the opportunities for discussion, conversation. They need reading and listening to books. 
that will help students learn those words. If we skip to the tier three words, government, senate, solar, planet, those are words that are very specific to a subject area. And they're really best learned within the context of that subject. Government and senate to social studies perhaps, solar and planet to science. So the words that are most important are those tier two words. Different, predict, reason, increase. These are words that will be used across the curriculum in many different subject areas, and they'll be used across the grade levels. So we really get the most impact in terms of vocabulary development when we teach those tier two words in an explicit, systematic, and cumulative way. The researchers also talked about the idea of not only choosing the right words to maximize impact, but also to maximize learning, it's important to use multiple strategies, use different context as you're teaching, and reinforce that vocabulary in many different ways. Provide those opportunities for discussion, reading, listening, and writing to learn those words well. So we know that the breadth of vocabulary is important to language comprehension. The depth of vocabulary is also important. This cartoon is funny. Yogurt, of course, is highly cultured if you understand that cultured has multiple meanings. And that's depth of vocabulary. So let's look at the word tip. It's a word that's easy to read, it's easy to spell, but it is a word that has many different definitions. I'd like to give you a moment to think about the different meanings of the word tip. You may want to pause your presentation as you think about different meanings of the word tip. So let's see how you did. Did you think about tip as meaning top? The tip of the iceberg is the top. Did you think about point? The tip of a pencil is the point. Did you think about advice, a suggestion, a hint as being a tip? Did you think about the money that is left for a waiter or waitress? Or the act of leaving the money for a waiter or waitress? Did you think about tip meaning to overturn or tip to mean tilt? Did you think about tip meaning to strike lightly, like tipping the ball with the bat? Or did you think about to raise one's hat in salutation? So we want students to be thinking about multiple meanings of words. The interesting thing is that many of the words that have multiple meanings are the words that students encounter early on in their reading career. These are all words that students will encounter in first grade and continue to see them throughout their academic careers. But they're all words that have more than one meaning. So these are words that you might work on at home to see how many different definitions students can generate. My favorite words are tip, as you just saw. I also like down, and we're going to talk about that word in a little bit as we talk about the functions of words. I also think run is a fun one to do, and home is a good one to start with. So uh, one other activity with multiple meanings is for students to write sentences using words with multiple meanings multiple times. So think about the sentence, I can, can beans, in a can. In addition to multiple meanings, it's important for students to understand the idea of shades of meaning. Why does an author use one word instead of another, even though they mean the same or almost the same? What is the author trying to convey? So if we think about an intensity thermometer, glad is synonymous with happy, as are ecstatic, pleased, and content. 
So if we were thinking about intensity and glad was at the lower end of intensity, which of those three words in the box would be at the highest level? Probably ecstatic, because it means overwhelmingly happy. Again, why is this important? Because it helps students understand the message that the author is sending. Why this word instead of that word? There are three things that students can do with synonyms. They can generate words that can be synonyms. They can generate synonyms for a particular word. And they can rank them. So I've taken a few words that can be synonymous with other words, and I've ranked them. So we could have some discussions about whether you agree with how I ranked the words. So again, it's important that students know words can have the same or almost the same meaning, but what is that shade of meaning that will really help them understand why an author uses that word? Semantics also includes non-literal language. Those are groups of words that, uh, by usage, have a meaning, but that meaning is not accessible by looking at each individual word. So as we think about the idiom, raining cats and dogs, we know it has nothing to do with cats and dogs falling from the sky. It just means that it's raining very heavily. So it's fun for students to think about the literal and the non-literal meanings of these phrases. And they can draw pictures of the literal and non-literal meanings. The next component that is important to language comprehension is syntax. Syntax has to do with the structure of sentences. So as we think about the structures of sentences, we're thinking about parts of speech, parts of sentences, connectives, how words and sentences are connected, and we're thinking about pronoun reference. When there's a pronoun, to who or to what is that pronoun referring? So the idea of syntax is helping students really understand the functions of words. So poor goose doesn't understand what duck is saying. Goose thinks that duck is saying words that are functioning as a noun. Duck, duck, goose. But what the duck is really saying is not a noun, it's a verb. Duck, duck, goose. So it is important for students to understand that words can have a function. And that function is going to be determined by how it is used in a sentence. So let's think about the word dog. Probably when you see that word, you think about this little guy, right? You think of it as a noun. When you see this word, this word has an S, so you probably think about these little guys, right? So let's use the word dogs in a sentence. The teacher dogs us about our homework. Huh. That didn't work, did it? The word dogs is not functioning as a noun in this sentence. This image works a little better. The teacher dogs us about our homework. It is now a verb. That teacher reminds me of my 10th grade English teacher who had us diagram 10 sentences every night for homework. But by diagramming sentences, I became very aware of how words function in sentences. So when someone asks you the meaning of the word dog, a good response is, it depends. To which you'll say, depends on what? And the response would be on how the word functions in a sentence. So here's the word down. Down has multiple meanings, and it has multiple functions. So I'd like you to look at these sentences and decide the function of the word down in each of these sentences. You may want to pause your presentation as you think about the function. 
What information is the word down giving us in each sentence? So let's see how you did. The baby fell down. What information does it give us? It tells us where the baby fell, and it's acting as an adverb. They drove down the street. Drove is telling us where with that phrase down the street. So it's acting as a preposition telling us where. The quarterback will down the ball. Down is telling us what the quarterback will do. It's acting as a verb. He took the down escalator. Down is telling us which escalator, so it's acting as an adjective. Down comes from geese and ducks. Down in this sentence is acting as a noun. It's telling us about a thing. Other important words that are connected to syntax are connectives. Connectives are usually conjunctions, and what they do is they help students connect the ideas that are found in multiple clauses in very long sentences in those compound and complex sentences. So if we look at the sentences on the screen, all of those sentences have the same clauses, but a different connective. So in the first sentence, the adolescent wakes up because the alarm goes off, because is telling us why the adolescent wakes up. In the second sentence, after is telling us when the adolescent wakes up. And in the third sentence, if, is telling us under what condition the adolescent will wake up. So the next component is pragmatics. And pragmatics involves the use of language. So this includes understanding context. It's also understanding the rules of conversation. So this cartoon is funny only if you understand the idea of context. The word miss can mean to long for something. Miss can also be the title of a pageant winner. So the woman on the right is correct to assume that that woman wearing the sash is part of a pageant. And she says, no, not a pageant contest. I just miss France. Now, if you don't understand the context of miss not being part of a pageant contest, then it's not funny. But that's pragmatics. Pragmatics is really helping students understand how language is used. So we've talked about the idea of idioms. Idioms are important because they're um, words that are used in a way that's not expected. And the author wants you to understand why they're using those words. But how do you know when a group of words is an idiom? Here we have the idiom, see light at the end of the tunnel. With the finish line in sight, Kayla could see light at the end of the tunnel. Well, there's no tunnel. There's no light at the end of a tunnel. So it is an idiom. An idiom that means coming to the end of a very difficult task. Is see light at the end of a tunnel an idiom in this context? No, because there's actually a tunnel and there is light at the end of a tunnel. So we do want to teach idioms, and we have to teach students this idea of context. When is it an idiom, and when is it not, that group of words? Pragmatics is also about rules of conversation, such as turn-taking. It's my turn. Now it's my turn. So also, in terms of rules of conversation, we want students to think about not only taking turns, but maintaining eye contact and noticing if the listener may need some clarification. And again, context is very important. So it's important for students to understand if 
a context calls for informal language or more formal language. For example, hey everybody, how are you doing? would be informal. Good evening, honored guest, would be more formal. So pragmatics is all about, pragmatics is all about the use of language. And that takes us to the last of the components that are important to skilled language comprehension, and that's discourse. Discourse is spoken and written communication. So as we think about discourse, this, we're, this is where we're talking about how we help students understand the texts that they're reading. We want them to know about literary language. What is symbolism, for example? We want them to understand the organization and flow of spoken and written language. So in text, we want them to be able to identify the main idea and the supporting ideas and details, for example. A skill that is really, really important to reading comprehension and is important to language comprehension is the idea of inference. Now, for this cartoon to be funny, you have to make a lot of inferences. You have to infer that the man is in the desert because there's a lot of sand and there are cacti. You have to infer that he's been in the desert a long time because of the footprints and the way he looks. And you have to infer that he's probably very thirsty because there's not a lot of water in a desert. So probably the last thing he wants is a pretzel because a pretzel has salt, which will make him even more thirsty. So there are a lot of inferences you have to make for this to be funny. And we know that the ability to make inferences best differentiates the skilled reading comprehenders versus those that struggle with reading comprehension. So inference making is important to reading success. What is an inference? An inference is an educated guess based on the evidence in the text and background knowledge. Background knowledge is a really important part of language comprehension and that comes from experience, it comes from being read to, and it comes through reading. So it's really important that students are continuously building their background knowledge because it supports comprehension and it supports the ability to make inferences. So to make an inference, students need to think about three different questions. What does the text say? That's the evidence. What do I know? That's the background knowledge. And to make an inference, those two answers need to be put together, the evidence plus the background knowledge. So here's an activity that helps students learn to make inferences. There are three passages, they're very short, just three sentences, and you'll notice that the second sentence is missing. So the task is done by having students think about what they can see, what evidence is there for them to see, and what might be that missing information based on their background knowledge. So in passage one, all the cars come to a stop, missing information, and then at the same time, all the cars speed up again. So we have to look at the evidence, the cars stop, and then they speed up again. What do we know about cars stopping and starting? They could stop because there's a stop sign. They could stop because there's a traffic light. Probably looking at the evidence because they started up at the same time, it's probably not a stop sign, but a stoplight. So what's missing is the idea that the traffic light changed. So when I look at that missing sentence, it says the red light turns green. So the students don't have to guess the exact words, but they just have to have the idea of what that missing information might be telling us. So in passage two, we have a candle that flickers and lights the room. 
Then the candle flickers, but it no longer lights the room. Why might the candle no longer light the room even though it's flickering? Perhaps a lamp is turned on. Again, students don't have to understand the exact sentence, just the idea. And let's look at passage three. The farmer picks the plump grapes as the clouds overhead grow darker and darker. The soaked farmer runs for cover under the trees. So what is missing in that second sentence? Well, we know there are clouds overhead that are dark. That often tells us there's a storm coming. The soaked farmer runs under cover, so he's soaked. Why? And why is he running for cover? And we might infer that suddenly the rain began to fall. Again, students do not need to know the exact words, just the idea. So in sum, we've talked about the science of reading, which is evidence. Evidence that comes from gold standard methodologies and tells us how students learn to read, has helped us identify why students struggle to learn to read, and has helped us understand the instruction that is important to reading success. And today we've been talking especially about that idea of language comprehension. We've talked about the simple view of reading and how language comprehension is a key component to reading comprehension. If it is missing, students will not develop proficient reading comprehension. And we've talked about structured literacy, which is the application of the evidence in the classroom. So as we talked about syntax and semantics and morphology, all of that is part of structured literacy. These are the components that students need to learn in a very explicit, systematic, and cumulative way. Have fun with all the activities that you've seen today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.